Professor Shera for the very warm introduction. And uh, my apologies, um, the Canterbury Pilgrims were a little late getting here from, 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 from London today. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's probably easier in, in uh, Chaucer's time than it is today to get from central London to here. So, yes, um, as, as Professor Chair has, says, uh, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the themes in my uh, recent book, uh, Wisdom in Exile. Actually, um, a couple of months ago, Professor Sher asked me to come and he suggested that perhaps I talk on uh, the topic of Buddhism and science. Um, that is something I do touch upon in, in this book, but I, I, uh, I'm no scientist, um, so, so I'm a bit kind of reticent to, to, to say too much about that subject. Let me explain how I came to write this book and then um, in a way um, suggest why th there might be some points here worth considering. I mean, I've written it from within the Buddhist tradition, that's, that's for sure. It's not an orthodox academic book. Um, but at the same time, because I was trained uh, as a historian of religions in my in my uh, academic life, then perhaps also that, that perspective shows up here. So it's, it's from within the tradition, but, but considering the, the place of Buddhism in the modern world. Actually, I didn't set out to write a book. I, I found that I'd written one when we collected various pieces that I'd produced over the past few years. Originally, the American Buddhist magazine Tricycle asked me to write a few pieces for them and uh, Tricycle is uh, is uh, really an example of if you like the American assimilation of Buddhism trying to render Buddhism in a in a form that's attractive to the to the modern American mind um, so I wrote a few pieces for them perhaps illustrating more of a kind of traditional line than most of the people who write for them do. And the second second element that went into the book is that a couple of years ago, the monastery and Dharma Center called Dagpo Kajuling in France, which is uh, perhaps the, the main center of the Kaju tradition in, in Europe, had their 40th anniversary. And uh, they spent the whole summer kind of organizing various events to, to celebrate that. And the administration team there asked me to, would I give a, a weekend seminar on what were they, if you like, the background circumstances in the West that, that have opened up a space for Buddhism. I never attempted to, to talk on that before because usually I, I just uh, teach from a, a very traditional way, you know, the way my masters taught me, but I accepted the challenge. And then a third element that went into the book was uh, came up a couple of years ago when some American students asked me, um, would I talk about Buddhism and politics? This was June 2016, and I think they were getting nervous in Los Angeles at that time. Um, and uh, I was very reticent to do that, to talk about Buddhism and politics. Um, but I thought, well, perhaps there's something useful to say, if, if at least to, to kind of, um, as it were, say what is not political about Buddhism and where we can draw the line between Buddhism and politics. So all these, these different strands came together when I realized that, in a way, I'd produced in essence, a kind of set of essays dealing with the twin topics of is there a space for Buddhism in the West? And how is it going, Buddhism in the West? How is it actually, how is it working out so, so far? Now, of course, it's just my perspective on it. And when I say Buddhism, I should also immediately say I'm a, I can only talk from the 
point of view of the Buddhism I learned from my own lamas. I can't really say I speak for the whole of Buddhism. That would be a great impertinence. And a third qualification. I'm going to talk about why I think there's a place or space for Buddhism in the West. But let me emphasize that. When we might argue there's a space for Buddhism, I would like to think that we see that space as existing alongside other traditions of spiritual practice and other traditions of, of intellectual inquiry, other, other philosophical traditions, if you like. Um, I, I feel that that is very important to, to establish as, as Buddhism is kind of um, finding some place in the West that we who speak, if you like, at least or, or speak to a certain extent for the Buddhist tradition, make it clear that, that it's a plural society which we want to be part of, a plural society socially, uh, culturally and intellectually that, in fact, the best times for Buddhism in history, when Buddhism itself has, has a, if you like, um, flourished best, and, and I would suggest that was in India between the uh, third and, and 10th centuries of the common era, was when Buddhism was part of, 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 of a great array of, of spiritual traditions, a great array of artistic and intellectual and endeavors um, because in a way I, I think it, 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 it's appropriate to say that Buddhism isn't necessarily for everybody um, from a, a, a deep Dharma point of view we would say that you know people may have karmic affiliations with Buddhism that make it uniquely suitable for them but at this particular time it's not for everybody that, incidentally, doesn't mean that, that we Buddhists don't see the distinctiveness of, of Buddhism and, and, in a way, we find it, it, it the, 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 the best of all traditions. We do. Uh, but, nevertheless, we recognize that it isn't necessarily going to appeal to everybody and, and, as, and there's, uh, Buddhism is something you have to ask for. Uh, that was the example, you know, the example set by Buddha himself was people had to ask for his teachings rather than he go out and kind of, as it were, badger them into them, convert them and so on. So similarly, Buddhism wants only a space. Buddhism wants perhaps to be at the table where the important conversation is, is happening. And I hope my, my, my book, in a way, is, is a contribution to, to earning Buddhism that, that place at the, the top table in contemporary culture. So what I've done in this, in this book, and I will read some portion of it, I think, uh, for you, what I've done is um, essentially begun with that question of what is it about Western culture, what is it about the, the, the situation in, in Western culture which may have opened up a place for Buddhism and for me the beginning of the answer to that question lies in the century in the 16th century in in European culture because it seems to me that the that was when changes began which shattered the the unity of the of the Western European world which is, of course, up to that time, essentially that of Catholic Christianity. And although the Renaissance played some role in fostering the individualism of modern culture, the Reformation decisively shattered the connection, I think, that, that bound humankind into, if you like, the cosmic order and left, in a way, uh, no kind of connection between humankind and the cosmic order except just the individual soul naked before an almighty and somewhat distant God. Of course, I'm in a way oversimplifying 
But it seems to me that that decisive move away from that organic worldview of Catholic Christianity led to the individualism, which on the one hand gave rise to a new style of philosophy, the free thinking and so on of the 17th century, which in turn fostered science. And on the other hand, the Reformation, with its shattering of the, of the hierarchy that's implicit in Catholic Christianity, also sparked off, as it were, turned to the political. So for me, and, uh, and if I read the, the chapter, you'll see this spelled out in more detail, the two dominant forces that have come in the last three or four centuries to occupy the role that was once played by, occupied by Catholic Christianity are the scientific, the rise of a scientific culture on the one side and the rise of a political culture on the other. By political, I mean, of course, a, a political culture that, that seeks to reorder the world and bring about happiness by that reordering of the, of the, of, of the social and economic world. The scientific, the rise of a scientific culture also puts its emphasis on the ec external world, that believing that, of course, by reordering, as it were, the, the physical arrangements of the world, and perhaps eventually the physical arrangements of humankind itself, it can also bring about happiness. So for me, it seems that the prestige that was once, once enjoyed by the church has flown to, to politics and science. And perhaps that has been to the good. Perhaps many good things have, have come from that in terms of, of, of opening up uh, things within society, producing a more liberal uh, society in some ways. And also, of course, there's been benef many benefits from technology. But one might say that the religious instinct has not gone away. And that the religious instinct is still alive. In some ways, perhaps, it, it can be uh, accommodated for in the kind of utopian element of, 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 of politics and in some of the kind of... the, the uh, aspects of scientific culture but the need to to find a connection with that which transcends the the mere accidents of the physical world and the mere arrangements of society that seems to be still present in many people perhaps not in all and here i think buddhism will find its space because if we insist that there is a, that science and politics can't bring about happiness as completely as maybe was once thought, and in fact often science and politics have engendered a whole new set of problems for humankind, then perhaps again we have to look to the to the spiritual world. But for many, although not for all, a return to Christianity, for instance, to fill the gap, the, if you like, the spiritual void left by the rise of science and politics, isn't really going to work. So it's here, I think, that Buddhism will, will have something to offer to modern European men and women. And that is because Buddhism is a spiritual tradition, but... It's a spiritual tradition which gives a major part to reason and critical inquiry. Buddhism, therefore, unlike most varieties of theism, does not depend for uh, its authority on an appeal, on any appeal to, to revelation or any appeal even to the authority of great figures in the past. Buddhism is, if, if you like, founded on experience and reasoning. This goes back to Buddha's own uh, uh, presentation to his, his followers that his words should not be accepted merely on his own authority, 
but rather they should take it and examine it and only if they found that that it was indeed reasonable and in accord with experience should they then try to put it into practice so in that sense that it it gives a, a great place to reasoning critical inquiry buddhism perhaps has something to say to those who who distrust religion because they see it perhaps fairly perhaps unfairly as depending exclusively on fideism on a, an appeal to faith but there's more i would say that buddhism has to 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 present to bring to the 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 table because expressed in the way i've just expressed it one would be forgiven for thinking ah oh, he's simply indicating that the buddhism is a philosophy but we we have many philosophies from descartes to wittgenstein we we have philosophies which are which are putting emphasis on the use of reasoning that's nothing new that buddhism is bringing but what distinguishes buddhism from those philosophies is that it offers also uh, methods of spiritual practice or as we might put it in a more buddhist way that buddhism says that it isn't necess- it isn't sufficient if we wish to uh, understand the nature of the world truly it isn't sufficient merely to have the right theory about it we can banish some of the more gross of our prejudices and projections about the world by analysis of theories but finally it's a matter of how we perceive and experience the world and that radical transformation in our way of experience in the world requires cultivation requires what we call in buddhism meditation uh, because uh, meditation uh, is a rather inadequate translation of the of the sanskrit term bhavana which means literally to to bring into being or perhaps more easily to understand to cultivate so for buddhism one must cultivate at the kind of deepest in the deepest recesses of one's being this way of understanding the world this which which brings about liberation which brings about awakening from the our bewitchment by our errors about the world so although philosophy is always concerned with it's best at least always concerned with unmasking our, our kind of errors about the world it really usually ends in theory in in a new position in a new description but for buddhism that drawing on its yogic tradition is not adequate we we must experience the truth of the world not merely theorize about it so to wrap that up buddhism offers not only uh, it presents itself not only as a, a body of critical uh, reasoning but also as a, as as a a set of 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 spiritual techniques I, i'm as you probably can see i'm rather hesitant about this world word spiritual i i i feel it's a rather contaminated world word with contaminated world also but uh but uh, we we're kind of stuck with it and then thirdly i think buddhism another thing that buddhism brings to the table and i think why therefore it deserves some space is that one of the the one of the consequences i think of the decline in the authority of 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 christianity um it is that there's a certain a a a certain amount of confusion around ethical issues um left in a way by by the decline of the authority of of catholic christianity partly it's because there are competing understandings now of what it means to be a human being but the downside if you like of the abolition of a, a spiritual view of humanity and its replacement by a relentlessly secular and in the case of some science but not all a materialist view of the human being is that it doesn't really um present any defenses for the integrity of human life and of the of human flourishing 
Now, Christianity has done that by its appeal, I suppose, to the idea that, well, we're created by God uh, and therefore our life is worthy, although perhaps there's an exception drawn around the animals for some, some reason, and that we're endowed with an immortal soul. But these are all things which a more sceptical time as our own doesn't really have patience for. And so is not having patience for such constructions of, of what it is to be human. It, it, it's easy, easy for people to kind of accept a more kind of mechanistic and financially more convenient way of treating human beings. Uh, and a political expedient way, not often. Buddhism defends the integrity of life, human and animal, but without introducing notions such as a, a, a god who is the underwriter or creator of this, or even of such static entities as souls. Buddhism does this because it, it insists on the integrity of consciousness, that consciousness is real, and consciousness pervades all sentient life. But it sees life as a process. It's, it does not see transcendental souls or, or, or fixed static selves or souls in that way, but nevertheless sees that human life and animal life too, all sentient life, is endowed with consciousness and therefore is capable of happiness and suffering. So it insists that we treat life in, a, in an ethical way. And it's capable of defending that because, it's, it's cap because it explains that through the theory of karma, action, cause and result, that our actions have consequences. We change ourselves and change others and change the world by our actions. So although it doesn't invoke commandments from a transcendental authority, a god, it still sees that we can distinguish between ethical actions and non-ethical actions. Ethical actions are those which are done in the absence of the poisonous emotions of desire, hatred and ignorance. Poisonous emotions which spring from the conceit of self and see others merely as objects to be exploited or to be crushed. So we, it is in their motivation primarily that we can distinguish whether actions are ethical or not. Not in whether they are the subject of some divine fiat. So Buddhism then has a different grounding for its ethical principles. But its ethical principles are just as intense and just as strong as those of, of Christianity. And yet it offers them without the recourse to theism. And then a fourth thing that we could say Buddhism brings to the table is this. One of the appeals, of course, of political ideologies is in their recognition of the suffering and blight that affects so many aspects of the world. The suffering that is visited on the poor, the suffering that is visited upon the, the weak. And so out of that comes an impatience and, a, and a, an urge to change the world. An impatience with those sufferings. But for Buddhism, the change, however desired it is, must begin in the human heart. In that way, we ensure that our actions in the world are indeed founded on a, a sense of really wishing others have happiness and really wishing that others are free from suffering rather than, as so often the case, a kind of partisanship which divides the world into the goodies and the baddies and ends up wreaking more destruction on the world. So Buddhism offers, it is best, it offers a way 
to work in the world, but one that is human-centered, that exists in the, the location of the heart and our relationships and building outwards from there. So in these ways, the Buddhism offers a critical philosophy rather than mere adherence to authority, that it allies that with spiritual or meditative practice, that it defends an ethical attitude, but without again recourse to theism, and that it offers a way to start a gentle transformation of the world, I think Buddhism has perhaps something to offer. It won't be for everybody, but it is a voice that perhaps needs to be heard alongside the dominant voices of Western culture, which I think are still to a certain extent those of theism, but of course increasingly those of of, uh, of political and materialistic uh, philosophies. Now, that's why I'd say there's a space for Buddhism. How is Buddhism doing in the West? How's it doing? Uh, it's a kind of progress report, perhaps. Uh, not bad, could be doing better. <laughs> First of all, it's early days. <laughs> it's early days, in a sense. Uh, it's often salutary to remember that the process by which Tibet became Buddhist, uh, and you know, for many many people, Tibet looks like, uh, in its flourishing period at least, the epitome of what a Buddhist society could be. It took the Tibetans about four hundred years to successfully assimilate the richness of their inheritance from, from Indian Buddhism. So being as how uh, Buddhism is, 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 is not that old in the West by any means, then perhaps one should not be impatient. Um, when did Buddhism come to the West? Well, there were certainly uh, translations of Buddhist materials appearing in Germany and Russia and uh, England and France at the beginning of the of the 19th century and although the number of native Western converts to Buddhism was extremely small during that that century there were a few and this salutary to remember. It's also salutary to remember because often the Western story of Buddhism in the West ignores this fact. There were actually, of course, already, particularly in America, Chinese and Japanese Buddhists way back in the 19th century. And they established in some ways the first uh, flourishing Buddhist communities in the, in the Western world. And I like to point that out because we often, in our kind of usual rather westocentric way, to coin a phrase, we, we often ignore that, that, that fact. But be that as it may, the, the kind of, the, 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 if you like, the public exposure of Buddhism in the West really gets going in the, in the 50s with the literary movement in America called the Beat Generation. And uh, then, the, then by the end of the 60s, early 70s, you're really starting to see the takeoff of, of new Buddhist centers and groups. In England, for instance, the, uh, the Buddhist Society was founded in 1923, the Buddhist Society in London was founded in 1923, and up till about 1970, there was only three or four other centers and groups in the United Kingdom. But then they exploded in number and continue to to do so. The latest census, there were 250,000 Buddhists in England and Wales, a half of whom were native English born, half of whom were more recent immigrants. But that's still 
uh, that doubled the census numbers from 2001. It'll be interesting to see what the numbers are in 2021. So from the point of view of numbers, Buddhism is not huge, but, but bigger, considerably bigger than it was. What are its problems? I think there, there are a number of problems that Buddhism faces in the West. Um, one which in a way is external, and so I'll just mention in passing, and then some which I think are internal to, to Buddhist communities in the West. The, the one which is external is the growing anti-religious temper of our times. It is, I think, easy to see that, that we live in a time when religion, uh, having suffered a, a long decline, I believe, from the period of the Reformation down to the present day, is almost falling off a cliff in, recent, uh, in the recent decade or, 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 or so, especially in terms of uh, allegiance among younger, younger people. And for various reasons, some of which are too complex and maybe even too sensitive to go, to go, to go into here, religion is now um, regarded by many, I think, as, as, as uh, at best completely and utterly irrelevant to life, and by many actually a, a, an extremely negative force, which we would all be better off uh, with it uh, passing away. Um, so there's a, a strong, I think, anti-religious bent in the in the modern world. It doesn't convince everybody. Not everybody's signed up to it, but but it looks like it's growing and will continue to grow. And although Buddhism, in a sense, I think has benefited from that up to a point, I don't think it will continue to do so. Let me explain that. Many of the people who come to Buddhism in the West uh, in the last 40 or 50 years, I read about Buddhism first in 1966, so I'm kind of long in tooth enough to, to know this. Most people who came to Buddhism came to Buddhism because they were dissatisfied with Christianity, or also in Judaism. A lot of American Buddhist people, for instance, come from a Jewish background not just the Christian background. So their dissatisfaction with religion, the religion that they've been brought up with or with the religion of their culture, left them attracted to Buddhism. Why? Because I think in many cases they felt that Buddhism was not really religion. That it was, that, that it avoided many of the, uh, uh, it escaped having the defects of, of, of religion. Now, the way I argued for Buddhism having a place at the modern table, you could say, well, have you just done the same thing? Well, yes and no. Because I, Buddhism is a religion in a sense that it believes in the transcendental dimension of being. It, it believes there's something more than birth and death. Buddhism is a religion in the sense that it has an organized system of thought about the world. And Buddhism has communities. So although Buddhism lacks a god, it has in many other respects the, clearly the, 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 the features of a religion. And often you find that many of the, much of the initial enthusiasm Western converts have for Buddhism actually disappears when they realize, oh my God, this is a religion. Perhaps the wrong, I addressed the wrong person there, didn't I? Oh my God, this is a religion after all. I remember many years ago uh, in Manchester, there was um, some chap came to our little Buddhist centre there and uh, he came to the beginner's class and the beginner's class was just featuring uh, calm abiding meditation. And he was very, very happy with that and he persisted with it for a year. Unfortunately, then he made the choice to come to a teaching I, <laughs> I, I was giving uh, on the, the graduated path. And this teaching began with, 
what it is to take refuge in the three jewels. He was most indignant. He said, damn you, I've been deceived. This is a religion after all. <laughs> so I wasted this poor Marxist, you know, oh, I didn't. I mean, he'd been, I hadn't been teaching his beginner's classes, but, but we wasted this poor Marxist chap, the whole year of his life he could have been spent bringing about the revolution instead of sitting on his bottom with some boring Buddhists. Anyway, you can't win them all. So I think there is a problem for Buddhism from the anti-religious temper of our times. I don't deal with that much in here, in this book. Rather I deal, as I say, with problems that can affect Buddhism from inside. And the first one, I think, is the problem that we may be tempted to assimilate Buddhism to existing elements within our culture. Which is why, he says, opening his recently published masterpiece, chapter <laughs> four, is it chapter four? Yes, is about science. Chapter three, science. It's not really about science. What it's about is that there's an increasingly vocal strain among some who describe themselves as Buddhists in the West that Buddhism must make itself fully scientific in order to flourish in the West. Now, what's wrong with science? Well, nothing, actually. Uh, science understood properly as the investigation of physical phenomena, how they, the laws governing their workings, and making predictions based upon those investigations about physical phenomena, is the application of reason to the physical world. It is neither good nor bad. It can, depends for what motivation we use it. But it has no, it in that sense offers no challenge or problem for, for Buddhism. Because it has nothing to say about the, the truly important matters from a Buddhist point of view, about the nature of the mind, the nature of reality, the nature of what is moral and what is not moral, how we may gain liberation from suffering. All these are questions which are the core concerns of Buddhism. In fact, you see, the argument that we should make Buddhism more scientific is very often a disguised uh, form of the idea we should make it materialist because there's all the difference in the world between a proper respect for science as praxis as investigation of the world and the philosophy which we could label scientism which believes that science alone is capable of answering all questions about the nature of reality about the nature of value about the nature of morality and so on that is actually materialism, which disguises itself as science, to cloak itself in the prestige of science. Materialism has been around as a philosophy since the time of the Buddha himself. Buddha knew about it and debated with the materialist, uh, pro the proponents of materialism. A Buddhism that accepted materialism would not be a Buddhism at all because it would not believe in the mind. And for Buddhism, the mind is the source of happiness and suffering. The mind is the source of what is virtuous and what is non-virtuous. The mind does not arise from physical things. It cooperates with them, just as the mind cooperates with the brain and the nervous system, but is not reducible to them. In this way, Buddhism argues for the reality of past and future lives, the workings of karma, and the possibility of nirvana. Without, if Buddhism was to become materialism, it would first of all become what Buddha described as annihilationism, a wrong view which he condemned just as strongly as eternalism, the view that creates immortal and changeable souls, and immortal, unchangeable creators, it would not be a Buddhism anymore. It would be a Buddhism, well, that would mainly be notable for people sitting on their bottoms in a distinctive way, 
but with none of the actual features of Buddhism. So we must resist this or else Buddhism will not be Buddhism anymore. The means of, disting of defeating materialism are there in our critical philosophy as well as there in the experience we can gain through meditation. Should we reject science as Buddhists? Not at all. We should appreciate it for its skills and the benefits that it can bring to, to humankind. Practice with due respect for its limits and due respect for its power and the necessity for human beings to use this power for good. So that is, the, I think, the appropriate Buddhist response to, to, the, the, to, to science, to distinguish it from scientism, as I say, a disguised materialism. But it's a strong thrust in the, in the, in the modern Buddhist world. I think to, because people feel the only way to make Buddhism respectable is to cloak it in, in science. I see this evening, for instance, the attempts by people who are actually Buddhists and don't, they would not for a minute be materialists, to kind of um, assess the validity of meditation by checking brain waves and, and so on and so forth. Now, I have nothing against your hobbies if that kind of thing turns, turns, turns you on, but I've just got to ask you one question. Would Jetson Milarepa, the great 12th century yogin, Kaju yogin, would he have achieved enlightenment more quickly if he'd known about the frequencies of brain waves or not? I think it's a question that is quite simple. Then, the second danger of assimilation is in chapter 4. Chapter 4 is entitled Politics. Politics, yes. What do I see as the problem? There's a danger for, politi for Buddhism, I think, in politics, in getting too close to politics in Buddhism being identified with a particular political system. We can start by considering an example from history. In the last century, many earnest Buddhists in Japan, many leading authorities, particularly within the Zen school in Japan, um, allied the prestige of Zen Buddhism to Japanese militarism and xenophobia. This is a kind of a story which has only emerged really in, in recent decades. But in other words, there's certainly a large body of opinion in Japan that Buddhism validated militarism, xenophobia, massacres, experiments on prisoners, and so on and so forth because the Jap Japanese imperialism and Buddhism were identical. It's horrifying, of course, and many Japanese Buddhists uh, are, are extraordinarily regretful about, about that episode. But it, it should be there in the back of our minds because we may feel that Buddhism is absolutely identical with our preferred ideology. I think we should be, kept, be cautious about that, lest we tie Buddhism to something that drags it down to destruction. In fact, you see, while Buddha himself, what were Buddha's political views? It's pretty impossible to discern what Buddha's political views are. Uh, not, that he wouldn't, not just that he wouldn't have known the word politics, which I think is Aristotelian in origin, but as we can, as much as we can reconstruct from his life, for instance, Buddha didn't have seem to have a preferred form of governance. He counselled kings who came to him. He counselled the republican oligarchs of his native Shakya clan. He didn't express a preference for either form of governance. When it comes to economics, Buddha had no economic theory. 
neither Adam Smith nor Karl Marx uh, passed his lips. Uh, beyond the need for honesty and avoiding livelihood which was built upon the exploitation and abuse of others, uh, Buddha had, and the fact that we should be content rather than greedy, Buddha said nothing which pertains to economic arrangements. That doesn't mean to say we as those who are Buddhists should not have views about these things, but it means we should be extraordinarily cautious about saying that we have those views because they're identical with those of Buddha. They're simply not. Buddha was neither, to use contemporary labels, neither right-wing nor left-wing, nor centre. And then one might say to that, well, sure then you should form a Buddhist political party that will truly represent Buddhist values in politics. You, you could, if you like, you go ahead. I would prefer to be a little cautious. The history of so-called Buddhist political parties and so-called Buddhist governments has not been completely a starry one. Uh, even in, in Tibet, um, where there was, uh, from 1642 onwards, uh, a government uh, which was identical with one of the major traditions, it is not without, shall we say kindly, it is not without its blemishes. So I, I think a becoming modesty about politics is good for us Buddhists. Besides which, it seems to me that much of modern politics um, is founded on a kind of subterranean Christian theme. This is something I talk about in the book when I talk about the legacy from the Reformation, that the, the Reformation, one of the kind of major outcomes of the Reformation, of course, was the, the transference of uh, the idea of the Christ coming and setting up the millennial rule and all just injustice being ended, all hierarchy being finished, Christ ruling with the, the elect for a thousand years. That sparked off the Peasants' Revolt in 1525, just eight years after Martin Luther toddled along to his uh, church in Wittenberg and started the Reformation. That so drew on Christian emotion and the Christian sense of a, a linear history, that history has a beginning, a middle, and a definite on, end point, and we're moving towards it. The whole of progressivism in politics seems to me to be, in a way, the, the continuation of this, even though the biblical elements have been somewhat submerged. They weren't in the 17th century, when this thing was replayed in England. Uh, but by the time of the French Revolution, of course, they had been submerged. But nevertheless, the conviction that there will be a cataclysm and the just will, will win the day and will issue in a perfect new, a perfect, um, end, perfect society, bring back the end of history in that way, that is a very major element in most political movements in the modern West. Uh, culminating in the 20th century, well, I should say culminating because who knows what horrors the 21st century <laughs> will bring, but uh, uh, coming to a grisly temporary climax at least with the Third Reich and uh, communism in the, in the 20th century. But you see, that view of history we Buddhists can't buy into. It's a Christian one. It's essentially a linear teleological, Christian teleological view of history. We, our view of history in Buddhism is cyclical. Things arise and pass away. Things improve and decline. There is no end of history in that way. Buddha will not return and, and bring about the end of history. Things rise and fall. The end of all rising is falling. The end of all gathering is dispersal. It's a melancholy view, rather tragic view of history. 
but it should make us skeptical about universal theories to bring about perfection in society, in the external world. Should we not do anything then? Yes. But with a becoming modesty, understanding that all improvements are somewhat provisional and to be really things that will bring about a positive change for others, they must be founded on a good heart, the heart that is full of kindness, not aggression and hatred towards the so-called unjust, the kulaks, the Jews, those standing in the way of social reconstruction, but one founded in a kindness towards the each and every individual. And therefore, the Buddhists, in a way, I think, should be somewhat skeptical of mass movements. Besides which, in our belief that politicians can reorder the world, aren't we asking a little bit much of them? We're asking them to be flawless individuals, when in fact, from a Buddhist point of view, flawless individuals are rather rare. <laughs> Most are like ourselves, rather broken and cracked vessels in whom the impulse to good struggles and sometimes loses to the impulse for selfishness. So the idea that politicians can bring about a perfect society, which again is part of the, if you like, the, the dominant ideological temper of our times, left or right, is something which I think the Buddhists should be somewhat sceptical of. So I don't want Buddhism, it's just my view, to be assimilated to any politics, left or or right. You can choose one, if you so minded, but don't identify Buddhism with it. That is my, my feeling. Because if we do identify Buddhism with one particular brand of politics, first of all, that will exclude anybody else who doesn't agree with that brand of politics. They'll see Buddhism as just the Buddhism of that party, of that particular cultural, of that particular cultural set. And inevitably, we will find, if we do that, we will find that we're backing what in the end, uh, uh, we've, we've tied the prestige of Buddhism to a project that will not bring about uh, a great deal of happiness, but probably issue in just the same old suffering as every other political uh, uh, progressive theory has uh, brought in before us. So I think we should be careful. That's what I say about Buddhism and politics. So those are the two dangers, I think, of assimilating Buddhism to our current ideologies, whether scientific or political. But there's another problem too. That is disillusionment. Partly because we have rushed into Buddhism without really sitting down and examining it properly. We're beginning to see uh, telltale signs of disillusionment in among former enthusiasts for Buddhism. I think it's partly because, or mostly because, we didn't examine Buddhism very seriously. We were attracted often by superficials, sometimes, as I've just been trying to suggest, because we rashly identified it with our existing values. So often it's the cause, cause actually, the, 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 the case that, that people feel that they are naturally good people, one kind of special like this, I'm naturally a peaceful person, I'm naturally a good person, I'm naturally a kind and compassionate person, and Buddhism is a kind religion. It's all for peace. So therefore, Buddhism's opinions, Buddhism's teachings, and my opinions, must be identical. Um, that is so often the case. Uh, but when such people come up against the realities of Buddhism, 
And at this point, I'm not even talking about, as it were, difficulties within it, but simply the actual teachings of, of, of Buddhism, which are very rigorous in terms of its analysis of, 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 of the world, in terms of, its, of analysis of our motives, in terms of its unsparingness about our capacity for self-deception, in terms of its dismantlement of our ideologies, all these things, if we stick around Buddhism long enough, we'll have to, we'll have to grapple with. That Buddhism doesn't mean what we think it did. That it's rather a tough view of the world that Buddhism is, 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 is proposing. As I say, a rather honest and unsparing view of the, of, of the, of the world. So at that point, often people will give up. But another consequence of not examining Buddhism very carefully before, as it were, embracing it, is often people embrace rather, how to put it, uh, objects that are not really worthy. That, uh, that in recent years we've been a little bit hit in Buddhism by, by uh, a number of Buddhist organizations or Buddhist uh, personalities who are not exactly really uh, shining examples of the three trainings, the moral discipline, meditation, and wisdom. I'm trying to say this without sounding like the back pages of the Sunday sport or whatever the, pa <laughs> the paper is. Certainly we, 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 we have scandals in Buddhism. But you see, these are not scandals of the Dharma itself, of the Buddhist teaching. And I rather think that if people put more attention to the teachings and be become convinced intellectually and experientially of the truths of Dharma, they probably wouldn't have been attracted to uh, the kind of charismatic but dubious characters or seductive organizations and even if they had initially run into them and then got disillusioned, they realized that the object of their disillusionment is that this person doesn't actually live up to Buddhism or this organization is not in accord with Buddhist principles. But too often, their attraction to Buddhism is not founded on that, that critical inquiry, is not a really profound adherence to Buddhism. It's rather superficial. So. In that case, they they will simply become they will simply reject Buddhism as a as a whole, and we can expect this. We can expect more of this because Buddhism as an institution, as an institution comprising human beings, is full of people who are simply followers of the Buddha's teaching. Not not they're not Buddhas. They're not fully enlightened beings. They come in all shapes and sizes. And to add to this, the fact is Buddhism is rather new in the West. And so people haven't yet found their bearings. It wasn't that there were no scandals in Tibet, for instance. I, I think there were sometimes people who, who misbehaved. But generally the checks and balances were there of, that come from having a thousand years of experience around Buddhism so that people were much more able to, to discern the characteristics of, of dubious behavior, of, 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 uh, of uh, outrageous claims, and, uh, and, and so on and so forth, in a way that we're not, because Buddhism is unfamiliar. So the answer to this problem, therefore, I think, for Buddhism is simply to, to quote uh, the, the, the phrase of uh, the, our former prime minister, uh, Mr. Anthony Aloysius Edward Blair, when he called for education, education, education. <laughs> but I would like to say Dharma education, Tony. Uh, this is what we need. But in the modern world, people don't have much time for that, unfortunately. They want quick and easy presentations. And, and, and uh, unfortunately, because of, of, of that, they're more likely to, to adhere to the, the flashy and the, 
and the and the charismatic and and get badly badly burnt by this any other problems for buddhism in the west oh how long have you got <laughs> but another one perhaps one I, I want to close on is one that some might not think is a problem i'm not really sure myself but and i do touch on it in here a little bit it's the rise of the mindfulness movement the i don't uh, propose to go into the history of, of, of this uh, movement um, and it is a movement i think um, now but in the last 20 or 30 years mindfulness has become extremely uh, even more so in the last five years extremely visible uh, in the in the kind of spiritual uh, and psychological marketplaces of course it definitely has its roots in in buddhism if you were to trace them we would be able to trace the the movement the movement's origins in burma through through uh, uh, Sri Lanka, through Germany to some extent, but mainly through America. And in all of those links so far, we would be looking at people who were very consciously Buddhist. But mindfulness now is, of course, far beyond those Buddhist origins. For many people, this is great because mindfulness offers a way, they believe, to bring people to Buddhism. The idea being that if people try mindfulness, they'll ineluctably want more and want to go to, to Buddhism. And I've been told that this was certainly the approach that uh, Dr. Kabat Zim, who I think is quite influential in this movement, was urging when he uh, launched things in the 1970s. But does it work? I don't mean does mindfulness work, that's another topic, but will it bring people to Buddhism? Perhaps, but just as likely it will prevent people from going to Buddhism. Why do I say that? Because mindfulness now is marketed as an ex exclusively secular thing with the, the, the unspoken or sometimes even spoken assumption being you don't need to bother with or get your hands dirty with any of that religious stuff, we present a kind of clinically uh, safe, uh, completely irreligious, completely non-Buddhist experience for you, one which all the Buddhism has been filtered out from. So whereas people before might have been attracted to med meditation, but would then find themselves, of course, going to Buddhist centers, because they're the people who, the centers that provided it, they don't need to do that anymore. And if one would be cynical, one would say that it's much easier to attend something that is promoting itself as utterly secular, with a secular trainer, and backed up by, my personal feeling, rather sketchy kind of scientific validation uh, anyway they think it's scientific validation rather than crossing the threshold of some incense perfumed rather strange oriental place which was probably a semi-detached house but has been converted into your local buddhist center that's quite a big ask as young people say nowadays it's quite a big ask to go into a buddhist center it's much easier to go for mindfulness but from the mindfulness, you're not that likely to go into Buddhism. So it's just thinking around this topic. But I, just as strongly as some people said, just as just it might be possible that mindfulness will bring people onto Buddhism, it's equally possible it will block the way to Buddhism. Because Buddhism doesn't start with meditation, incidentally. The classic scheme, the three trainings, is ethics, meditation, wisdom. M mindfulness is not ethics, not wisdom. It, it might ally itself with ethics, but there'll probably be Western progressive ethics rather than authentic Buddhist ethics. It certainly does not investigate the 
irreality of all phenomena, both physical and mental, as wisdom uh, does in, in Buddhism. And even with regard to meditation, it's an ent extremely reduced, somewhat shrunk down form of one particular type of Buddhist meditation, which is present in mindfulness. So it might bring people to Buddhism, but equally it might, it might block the door very successfully to people coming to, to Buddhism. So those are, I think, some of the, the problems for, for Buddhism. Of course, you could say, shouldn't you as a, a Buddhist and somebody who Professor Shara described in all this way, shouldn't you be kind of more rah-rah or more encouraged and saying, Buddhism is the wave of the future? Yeah, I'm a Buddhist. We like to look at causes and conditions, see how it's going. We're not that optimistic. <laughs> so with that, I again want to thank, uh, thank you all for coming. My apologies again for, for being late, but uh, I'll close simply by saying I'm very happy to come to Canterbury uh, in April because as the great Chaucer tells us, that's when all the pilgrims come to Canterbury. Okay. <laughs>